for the four square denomination over the Northwest and this is my home church and I was thinking about it before church today and I, I have the incredible, I mean it's just incredible to me, God been so good to me, I mean as I think about it because my pastors double as my son and daughter-in-law. Isn't that great? How many people can say that, that their pastors are their son and their daughter-in-law? And I am so proud of them, I love them so much, and they're doing such a great job of pastoring this church, and I just, that's my life. But honestly, like most grandparents, I love their kids more. And one of my deals is that I bring their two girls to church quite often, and we make an adventure of it. We stop at the human being and get some donut holes. And I get a, I get a cold brew because I'm already tired before 9 o'clock this morning from chasing them around for a couple hours. But then I get to take them and check them into our children's ministry, to our family ministries. And I don't know if you know that, this about this place, but we invest more money in that area of ministry than any other in the place. And we believe that age-appropriate presentations of the gospel radically change the lives of the people that go in there, those little people. So we partner with you to make sure that your children know everything that they need to know in an age-appropriate way uh, so that they will follow Jesus. And I'm just excited every time I get to drop them off back there. And then I go pick them up and they show me what they've made and they tell me what they've learned. It's just a great, great place. We're in the book of Acts. Uh, we've decided that after a pandemic and a cultural wars and upheavals that we should go back to the basics and see how the early church did it. And uh, I get today to talk to you from Acts chapter 19, which Chantal finished in 18, which was the end of what we call Paul, who we're talking about mostly in, Acts, in the late chapters of Acts, um, was doing. In Acts chapter 19, he's beginning his uh, third missionary journey. And those of you in the crow's nest, hang with me because I'm, I'm going to skip some stuff because uh, I have things I want to talk about this service. So. Uh, one of the things I want you to understand about Acts chapter 19 is that there are some questions that should be raised for you as I talk to you about the things I'm going to talk to you about today out of Acts chapter 19. So here are what I believe are three questions. There's more. Acts chapter 19, I can't cover it all. There's some great stories. I could pe preach a sermon over all these little sections, fun stories, but I'm going to choose three particular stories. And the first of them leads to this question, what do you understand about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? What has been your response if you have heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because there's lots of confusion in the world about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The second question is, have you experienced a miraculous encounter with the power of God? Have you ever been touched by God? Have you ever had something happen to your life where you just got to go, wow, that, that was God? And then the third question that comes out of this chapter that I want us to wrestle with today is what personal price have you paid to be a follower of Jesus? What personal price have you paid? Because if you don't know this about the gospel, it is counter-cultural. Everything about culture says rise to the top. Everything about the gospel says go to the bottom. You want to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to be the servant of all. That's counter, counter cultural. So by chapter 19, Paul has already planted lots of churches and he's going around and visiting, visiting them as a part of his third missionary journey. This is the one that ends him up in Rome where he is martyred. But he gets back to Ephesus, which is a community that he told them when he left. He only spent a day or two there. He said, if the Lord wills, I'll come back. So he gets to come back. And here's what I want you to know about Ephesus. Ephesus is in what is now modern-day Turkey. 
It was probably at this time one of the largest cities in the world. It had a population of well over 200,000 people, which again was one of the largest cities in the world at this time. And it's the center of magical arts. So what we would call the occult today, what we would call witchcraft today is, I mean, this was the center. This was the very heart of that. And part of the reason is that it was the home of the Temple of Artemis, and legend had it that Artemis actually had fallen on this spot of ground. This is why the Temple of Artemis is there. And again, all these magic arts are surrounding the worship of the, of the god Artemis. And yet here's something interesting about Christianity in those times. This is one of the places in the very center of these dark magics that the gospel was exploding. I mean, Christianity was exploding in this place. And Paul comes back, so he's here, and he comes into the community. And when he comes into the community, as we start Acts chapter 19, he discovers some, some followers of John the Baptist. And if you remember, John the Baptist was actually a cousin of Jesus that was the forerunner of Jesus, that proclaimed Jesus was coming. It's how it was all set up. It was all prophetic uh, fruition of all of the Old Testament prophets that there would be this one, and that's John the Baptist. So what I want you to understand and what I want you to watch and why I believe it's a part of Acts chapter 19 is that Paul, Luke who wrote Acts, wants us to see how you turn somebody from a disciple of John or something else into a disciple of Jesus. And he asked two questions, and let me read this little section to you. It says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus where he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they replied, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, into what then were you baptized? And they answered, into John's baptism. And Jesus, or Paul said, John, ba John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. To get, altogether, there were about 12 of them. So they replied to the first question that they hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. So again, in other words, we never heard of this. But in all honesty, that's impossible because all that John talked about that was that the coming Messiah was going to baptize everybody that came into his presence with the Holy Spirit and fire. So they would have repeatedly, if they were really following John the Baptist around, they would have repeatedly heard that. And if they had any religious upbringing at all, they would have known that all of the Old Testament prophets also talked about the coming Messiah and his bringing the Holy Spirit and the releasing of the Holy Spirit and the baptizing of the Holy Spirit. So it was repeatedly taught. So they wouldn't have said that. And what we believe that they were actually saying is that we didn't know that that time was here. So in other words, they had left the region before Jesus was arrested before Jesus was beaten and crucified, before Jesus was buried, and before Jesus rose from the dead and then ascended to heaven. So they didn't understand and completely know the end of the story and that at the end of the story, the Holy Spirit was going to be released. So in essence, what Paul is saying, it's here. That season of the Holy Spirit is here. It is upon us. And to me, this, this is important for us today because I think that there is a ton of confusion about the role of the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But here's what I want you to know. It's going to be on the screen. The power of the Holy Spirit is one of the vital elements of the gospel. 
And I think it's critical for today's followers of Jesus to understand the work of the Holy Spirit and appropriate the promises of the Holy Spirit that are provided to us as Christ followers. Now, I don't know about you, but I do not and did not need, in the condition I was in when I met Jesus, I did not need a weak God, a weak Savior, or no power to overcome the things I'd gotten entangled with. And I didn't find a weak God and a powerless God. I found a powerful, powerful God. So these followers of John were told about what happened on the day of Pentecost because it hadn't reached them. It confided in them that uh, these things need to happen. This is what Jesus uh, did for you. He explains to them that although John baptized them into this baptism that was for repentance, that was incomplete and led them into a complete understanding of the salvation discovered and bought in the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus so that they would understand completely who it is that you're putting your faith in, who it is you're receiving when you give your life to the Savior, to Jesus, and then that in addition to that, there's this second occurrence where you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I like to simply say, you get to open the gift and take everything that Jesus has for you. So he invited their, these men to put their, these people to put their faith in the complete ministry of Jesus. And they, whoa, accept it. They accept it. They just simply say, yeah, I'll take that. I'll do that. And I want you to know today that if you've not done that, you have to do it. And it's up to every single individual to make that decision. I believe not just to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but to say yes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit that the Spirit of God would be released completely. So again, when Paul lays his hands on them after baptizing them in water and inviting the Holy Spirit to come upon them in power, that is exactly what happens. And again, the power of the Holy Spirit is one of the vital elements of the gospel. And just like on the day of Pentecost, these people spoke in tongues and began to prophesy. Prophesy. So many would say, some would say that that is something that is in the past. That's not for the church today. That's, that's not something that's happening any, anymore. But we as Pentecostals believe that absolutely is still happening, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he's still doing what one of the great theologians, John Wimber, said. He's still doing the stuff. He's still doing the powerful stuff. And the invitation of Christ oftentimes is not complete because the person hasn't, and this is my personal experience, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit the way these men did in Acts chapter 19 and way, the way it happened on Pentecost. So again, for 2,000 years, this has been an argument that's happened in the church, and it's one of the things, quite honestly, that still divides the church today. Is it a separate experience? Do I have to speak in tongues? What is this thing about the Holy Spirit? And the theologies have built, been built to, to answer both of those questions the way those that profess them want to present the argument. So they can make a biblical argument that, yeah, it, it's a thing of the past, and we can make a big biblical argument. And I'm taking you there right now. That's what Acts 19 is about that says, yes, it still is happening and it is a separate experience or can be. And I want to explain something to you because I came out of a tradition that didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when I started to hear about this possibility, I, I want you to understand how I'm wired. And it's keep it simple, stupid. So for me, when I started hearing about this, I just simply started praying, God, if that is you, I'm in. I'll take some of that. I want all that you have for me. I, I, I was drinking hard from the well that is the world, and I'm going to drink hard from the well that is Jesus and everything that he has for me. So come on, bring it on, and I'll take it. And man alive, in that simple little prayer, which is all it was, a simple little prayer, just like the prayer I prayed when I asked Jesus to come into my life, man, the Holy Spirit came upon me, and I have never, never been. 
And what's interesting about that in the world that we live in, I don't know if you've heard this, but we are considered now in a postmodern era. So what the postmodern era is going to be most signified by is that everybody's going to want to live in a way that they just get to do what they want. They get to decide what's important. They get to pursue what they think is important. In the modern era, there was this thing called Christianity that kind of built some guardrails and, and kind of helped to fashion and, and, and function in the world and keep the world kind of, you know, at least somewhat insanity. But in the postmodern world, Christianity has been pushed to the side. There, there's, there's no thought about a God. There's no thought about a Savior. There's no thought about anything else. But we just get to do what we want. And, and what we really want, we're chasing experiences. And as I've started thinking about it, I'm thinking to myself, man, what they're really chasing is an encounter with the God that I've encountered. Because you, there, there is no greater experience on the face of the earth than coming face to face with the power of God and His Holy Spirit. Man, once the Spirit comes upon you, it's all over. Paul himself, and I'm paraphrasing phrasing this, said this, I'm so glad that I have all that Jesus has for me. And again, this is the place, if you want to know where to take somebody, Acts chapter 19, this is where we defend that it can be, and often is, a separate experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to actually give you an opportunity today, if you've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit at the end of the service, to come forward and get prayed for to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to spend any more time talking about that because I believe I've said enough. But I do encourage you, if you still wonder about that, check the scriptures, talk to people you trust. So Paul, at this particular point, after this encounter, he starts teaching in the synagogue, and as has happened at every turn in Acts, there's some persecution that comes against him. So he's just doing that on Sunday, so he goes to what would be something similar to the Yakima Convention Center in Ephesus, and just every day starts meeting with people and talking about Jesus, and man, Again, everything is exploding. People are going crazy. That's not speaking in tongues right there, by the way. That, that, uh, I've experienced that, too. I, I know what that feels like. So he's in this place, and he's teaching. And here's what's different about Paul's teaching than anybody else that had taught. In another way, I want to drag you into a conversation about the miraculous. It says this. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that when the handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, their diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. Mari, as she was leading worship, had a conversation with us about being delivered from things that are, we're in bondage to. That's what deliverance is all about, the things that you are bonded, uh, in bondage to. Uh, for me, it was drugs and alcohol, and I, I, the power of God set me free from those kinds of things, diseases, healing, wholeness. Yeah. Who, who needs a weak God? But there's something interesting up here, because handkerchiefs, I have two twin seven-year-old identical twin granddaughters. And they're just at that stage at seven where they're starting to tell me jokes, but they do an interesting thing. When they're going to tell me a joke, they go, knock, knock. So I'll go, who's there? And they say, how do you get a handkerchief to dance? And I'll say, I don't know. And they'll say, put a little boogie in it. <laughs> That's two services I've gotten away with that joke. But it's because of that that I think I'd have touched the apron and not the handkerchief. Because <laughs> who wants to touch a nasty old handkerchief? Yeah. But what I want to bring to your attention here is that the Holy Spirit is all about power. It's about power. And we've described it as the kingdom of God being released. That this is really the kingdom of God being released. And when the Holy Spirit is released, it, it, it just allows God to do the miraculous, the incredible. Jesus taught that. 
that that's what was going to happen. He says, it's good for you that I leave because when I leave, I'm going to give you the helper, the Holy Spirit, and you will do greater things than I have done. And you've watched me do all this crazy cool stuff, and you're going to do greater stuff because the Holy Spirit is being released, and you can receive that, and you can walk in that, and you can live in that. The kingdom of God is released. But it, how expectant are we that God's still doing the stuff? The kingdom has been released in power. And here's what I want you to understand. When Jesus is present, the power of his kingdom are present too. So, what that really means to me is that wisdom is present, that healing is present, that joy is present, that protection is present, that provision is present, and much, much more is present when God is there. And our Bible makes an interesting declaration to us. It just simply says, where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there. So I don't know if you know this, but we're gathered in his name. We, we, we sang a song that we just said over and over and over and over and over and over the name of Jesus. And Jesus said, when my name's lifted up, all men and women will be drawn to me. So God is here. And he wants to do big and great things. But do you even expect that? Do you think that? Is that too hard for you to believe? Most of what deters us is oftentimes our own low self-regard. I am too far gone for Jesus to do anything for me. I've done way too much for Jesus to respond to my cries, to my pleas. I'm too far gone. I want you to understand something. You're not too far gone. I was actually at the end of the line in the too far gone. There was nobody beyond me. So you're not too far gone. The power of God was released into his church. And it is for us. And I hope you'll embrace that today. But I also want you to understand, and we're very, very committed to this around here. It was for the world outside these doors too. And they are searching. And they are hungering for an experience that only God can give them. So we have to be people who expect and walk in the fullness of what Jesus wants to do. Would you stand with me? Father, I give you praise today. What an incredible opportunity to come into a building that's got an auditorium where we can worship you and proclaim your power and authority over not just us and our lives, but the world. You, you took care of it. The answer is Jesus. And we know that. So my prayer today is that what you would move in this place. My prayer today, if there's hurt and pain, physical, mental, relational, that we'd open our hearts and our hands and receive the power to be healed and to be set free. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How many of you would say, that's me? By raising your hand, would you just say, that's me? I need him to touch and to do a work in me. Well, it might not have felt like a very bold act, but you raising your hand was an incredibly bold act. 
Holy Spirit, would you do what you promised to do in these people whose hands were raised? We always give this opportunity. If you've yet to say yes to Jesus as your Savior and Lord and you want to do that, heads are bowed and eyes are closed, would you lift your hand and say in, in recognition, I've never done that. I've never asked Jesus into my life. This God that you're talking about, this power that you said is available to me, I, I've never received that. I don't know that. I see that hand back there. That is awesome. That is awesome. I see that hand too, okay? I'm gonna pray a prayer, we're all gonna say it. Some of you have wandered from that commitment that you might have made a while ago. Say this prayer with your heart being, I'm, I'm coming back, I'm back. I wanna walk with you, Jesus. I wandered away, I'm back. So here's how this, I mean, it's so simple, but pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I want you. I want the salvation that you promised. I want the forgiveness that you've promised. I want the life that you died to produce for me. I want the freedom. I want the deliverance. I want the mission. I want the purpose. I want to live my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's applaud with those that made that decision.